school and sort of what I wanted to do was just have a nice little chat. Um, it's a little bit of a, like a little, it's a it's a surreal moment sitting around a log burner, log fire with David Bradley having a paint, speaking about <laughs> Kes. Um, I'm sure you'll understand it's, it's an iconic film. Um, what we seen before, it's like 27th best film in the world. It, uh, there was there were two polls done at the turn of the 20th first century. One was uh, conducted by um, the British film industry, which con uh, comprised of press, my peers, and fans. And it was voted the seventh best UK film of all time. And then they did a world poll of all films ever made uh, in the 20th century and before. And it, it was uh, voted 27th. Which uh, isn't bad for a, a little film uh, that cost only a quarter of a million I, quid. I knew, in, I knew British film it was right up. I didn't think in world film, I, didn't, I wasn't sure. Yeah. I never even thought about it for the you know, 27th out of every single film ever made with a budget of... A quarter of a million, million quid. Power. Yeah. Um, that's an achievement. That's nothing, that's is it? Achievement. That's nothing. Um, and it was... So, I mean, one of the things that gets me is... I know that you had a bit of acting, you, you, you've done a little bit of acting, but how did you come about the part of Billy? I guess, I, I remember, I, had a, I, I was very lucky at school because I got on well with my teachers. I, I wasn't, I wasn't a, a, a kind of a good kind of academic no. student in anything, but what I did was I engaged with them. So if I didn't understand something at school, I challenged the teacher. I remember one of my math teacher told me that a minus times a minus equals a plus, right? Which is, it's a, a mathematical equation. Well, at 13, 14 years of age, that doesn't make sense to me because if I don't have 10% in there, and I multiply it with that 10% so that I don't have in there, I don't end up with a, a pound in my back uh, pocket. That still doesn't make sense you know, to me. You're exactly. <laughs> so so I, I did have a good relationship with my school, and my English teacher saw me when I was at my primary school, when I did a nativity play there, which I played the innkeeper after several pe persons who were supposed to be the innkeeper decided that they, they, they freaked out and couldn't do it. And, and I uh, made a right fool of myself and had the entire assembly hall in, in huge laughter and, and, and went down a storm. They thought I was great with my Barnsley accent, you know. And, and we, um, we decided, because of the success of the Nativity, to do another play as our end of school year, my last year. I failed my 11 plus, which happened in those days. And we decided to do a school play, which was a Chinese play, where I played the part of um, a property man. I only had one line. Where every, every time I said this line, I had everybody cracked up again. Because being the property man, I would bring out various pops and things like that. And one of the things that I brought out was a, a blue corrugated river cardboard with a duck. So every time the duck had a line, I used to go, wah, wah. and you know, it, they fell about laughing, or, or I'd fall asleep and start snoring. As a 14 year old, 11 year old, kids love it. And my English teacher at my secondary modern school, where I failed my 11 plus and went to, had seen me there. And when I arrived at the school, he'd seen the, this play. They decided to do a, a school panto for the first year, the first time ever. And most senior schools at that time were still doing nativity plays, carol singing. They weren't being more ambitious. And ours was a secondary modern school. And some of the teachers took parts, like the Dame and and uh, and the Witch. We did Humpty Dumpty was the first year, and 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 I was one of the brokers boys. They were called Lounge and Scrounge, and it was a huge success. That happened the second year with Hansel and Gretel. I played Glock, and I had a mate who played Spiel, so we were Glock and Spiel, right? The third year we did Sinbad the Sailor. And I got promoted because I was now going down so well with everybody and comfortable on stage that they wanted me to play the comedian who falls in love with the comedian. And our, our school pantos were more successful than the professional panto in town. Uh, we were cramming them in. We had maybe five and a half, six thousand people in eight performances. That's a lot of people. It's a lot more than just relatives and family. 
And during that time, Barry Hines had left my school and went to another school where he worked with Brian Glover and had written a film, a book called A Kestrel for an A. Ken Loach and Tony Garnett had heard about Barry Hines because they wanted to uh, film uh, uh, his previous book called The Blinder, which he wasn't particularly concerned about. He, Barry Hines had the gall no. to tell them, no, you can't do my, no. my book that on was football. football one, wasn't it? it was about a foot, uh, like a Georgie Best uh -huh. of his period. But Barry Hines, who most writers would have jumped at the chance of making a film, said, no, I don't want you to make a film of this book. I'm writing another book, and you can see where I'm writing if you like. And Ken Loach, the director of Kess, Tony Garnett, the producer, who were working at the BBC, uh, looked at each other, obviously, and said, uh, well, OK, when you finish the book, send us a draft and we'll read it. So Barry finished his book about eight weeks later, sent them his first draft, they read it and they realised that this was the story they wanted to do. But Ken Loach works in a very unusual way. He doesn't use professional actors. He prefers to have ordinary people to get realistic performances. So there's only one character in the entire movie who is a, really a true professional, which is the English teacher Colin Welland. So Barry, Ken and Tony went around three schools that were in the lower kind of academic league, as it were, two that were secondary modern schools, kids who had failed their 11 plus, and a middle school, and they, they auditioned about 30 or 40 from each school. They whittled down the number to around about 35. We went to the best hotel in town, where we had um, salmon, salmon paste sandwiches, which was like, you know, this was royalty. We had not salmon paste, we had bread and dripping or potted meat, not salmon paste, and orange juice. And we read a couple of scenes. One was the fight on the coke. And I think that the one that, that, that kind of pushed it in my direction was the library because the four or five kids who were auditioning for Billy, we were told what we were going to, what the, the scene was about, but we were asked to improvise. I was, the, I was about the last one that went up, but I watched everybody, watched everybody else, and I couldn't understand why they walked into this room and went directly up to the librarian and, and said, I'd like a book on falconry, please. And I thought, that's not Billy. That's not what Billy would do. He knows that the very question, the first question the librarian's going to say is, are you a member? Well, he's not a member. So he's not going to prompt that question. So when I did my audition, I went round the walls as if I was pulling out the books and seeing... Uh, not going to make him remember. That's right. And he had to encourage me over. Because he said, excuse me, son, can I help you? And I said, no, it's all right. I'm just looking for a book on falconry. Oh, all right. And then I carried on looking. He said, uh, excuse me. Uh, no, it's all right. He said, are you a member? And we had this little... And then he encouraged me over to where he was sitting. And then we had an improvisation speech. And it was about a week later that I got this letter that was delivered by the third assistant director. And I remember it specifically. I've got it somewhere. If I can find it, I'll send you a copy of it so you can, you can, you can actually show people. You can do a, a quick still. And it was written in purple ink in 1968. Well, I'd never seen purple ink in my life. It's either black or blue. Red was exotic, but purple, you know. Red and beige normally on your school book you get into trouble. That's right. Well, purple was like royalty. It's like, it's like the religion, isn't it? And, and, and the king and queen use purple ink. So it said, dear David, we'd like you to uh, play the part of Billy Casper in, in Barry Hines's book, A Kestrel for a Knave. After school today, if you wish to play Billy, of course I did, would you go and meet the Kestrels at Barry Hines and Richard Hines location, at Barry's house, so that he, they can introduce you to these Kestrels and get to the point where we can start integrating you with regards to, to learning about farming.